CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach that takes on each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills to provide creative solutions for their clients. Based right here in Western New York, CTBK is a champion for your business and our community. Additionally, CTBK goes beyond tax and attest services by offering a wide array of consulting and outsourced solutions tailored to meet the unique needs of your business, allowing you to focus on your operational and long-term strategic goals. Whether you're a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, the team at CTBK is determined to help you succeed. Visit ctbk.com or call 716-630-2400, 716-630-2400 to learn how CTBK's one-team approach can work for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with my co-host Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. It's been almost two weeks uh, since our last podcast. Uh, We skipped a week uh, after uh, we previewed the Bills at Bengals game. Of course, a lot has happened since then. And because so much has happened and because I was out of town, that uh, precluded uh, recording the podcast, even if I would have had an appetite to do it, uh, which I didn't really. Um, And uh, there's a lot that we can talk about regarding DeMar Hamlin. I do get a sense, though, that people are ready to move on to discussion that uh, Matthew Fairburn and I had in the press box uh, prior to the Patriots game because Matthew went to that game. Uh, to write about the emotional aspect of playing the first game after DeMar Hamlin's cardiac arrest. By this time, he'd uh, already uh, come out of his um, his sleep uh, and uh, was off the ventilator, I believe, by Saturday. I'm forgetting the timeline of things. He was still in Cincinnati. Or had he been even returned uh, back to Buffalo? No, yes, you are correct. He had been off the ventilator and he came back to Buffalo. It's all a blur. And and I'm not, I'm not saying that flippantly. It's, um, I I had, uh, I struggled with it myself as a journalist uh, because I know that it is my job to cover such things uh, in a, in a very general sense. I'm not a hardcore giving you the uh, every little update type of journalist. Uh, I'm generally the type of guy who will uh, like to wait for everything to have happened or as much as possible and then give everyone a deep dive as to what transpired, how it transpired, uh, rather than giving uh, breathless updates, um, which uh, were coming from the team, from the family, uh, from the NFL, from the hospital. Uh, There really wasn't a lot of um, original reporting to be done off of the the DeMar Hamlin story. In fact, uh, The Athletic wanted me to stay in Cincinnati. My original assignment uh, from my editors uh, was, I am not to leave Cincinnati until DeMar Hamlin leaves Cincinnati. And we found out after about a day and a half that um, I wasn't doing The Athletic any good in Cincinnati. So I came back uh, that um, was a wrinkle to the week, uh, again, that uh, stopped us from from recording a Tim Graham and Friends. But I'll be honest, Joan, I, I think throughout the week, I just had, I had, I had no desire uh, to do a podcast. Some of it was, uh, it felt exploitative. Um, I, I didn't have anything new to say. I didn't have anything to add that wasn't being reported somewhere else. I didn't even have the desire to write. I didn't have the desire to tweet, let alone write. Uh, As you go and check my feed, uh, my Twitter account is basically retweets of official statements and whatever anybody else was reporting. The occasional Saber story from Matthew Fairburn or a story from a different outlet here or there. But I haven't done any tweeting. I didn't want a podcast. I didn't appear on Buffalo kickoff live last Sunday. Um, I, I, I'd gone on record uh, through my written word that I didn't think a game should be played last week. 
that I thought that the Bills were dealing with an awful lot of mental distress. And um, the game, especially after the Kansas City Chiefs won on Saturday, didn't mean nearly as much. The Patriots needed it more than the Bills needed it. And um, anyways, I, I've, I've used the phrase already, but I'll use it again. I didn't have the appetite for it. And I don't know if that means that I've lost a little something as a journalist, maybe. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so much of the, the, the media whirlwind that was going around, uh, just, uh, I didn't, didn't feel like I wanted to be a part of it. So I checked out for a little bit, ended up writing a couple of things, but not a lot. And, uh, here we are. Uh, the bills are entering the playoffs against the Miami dolphins. I finally feel like we're back after the bills played the Patriots, got that uh, game behind them. It is the playoffs now. DeMar Hamlin is out of the hospital and back in Western New York. And for all we know, we'll be leading the charge uh, tomorrow afternoon against the Dolphins in Highmark Stadium. Um, all good news. And I think we can now focus on, or at least I, I don't want to say we, but I can focus on, on a football game again when, Last week on Channel Four, we would have we, we were expected to do our players to watch and our key to the game and predict the score. Uh, and I had already said that I didn't think a game should be played, so I told the guys at the station, "I'm going to sit this one out." And uh, hopefully, I didn't offend anybody by doing that uh, or uh, make it or make it inconvenient for any of my teammates there. But um, that's that's where I was about it. So if you want to be my shrink and tell me where I'm right or wrong or ask me questions about it, I'm I'm on the couch. Well, I don't know if you're right or wrong, and I think it's very fair for you to experience and analyze these situations this way. I guess the only thing I would say, I mean, going back to trying to remember some of the things we talked about on this podcast the last time we did it, um, we have been critical of the NFL and the Bills by proxy for playing games through snowstorms and going out of their way and, and in some ways, you know, violating travel bans and things like that. The, the show must go on aspect of the NFL that was not stopped by larger uh, than uh, life, bigger yeah. than bigger than everyone else, bigger than me, bigger than you, bigger than everyone. Yeah. And we talked about how nothing would stop the show of the NFL uh, we drew the comparison with the Sabres that that was not an essential activity. The Sabres had two games postponed and other sports, UB football had a game postponed, but the NFL television product was too important for any weather event to knock that off the schedule or to change the, even the planned practice schedule leading up to those games. I mean, I did find it interesting among the many, you know, emotions and intrigue that came about of this story, but I found it interesting that in this case, the show didn't go on. And I know there was some criticism for the NFL and there was some hand wringing in the moment because it took them maybe 20, 30 minutes or up to an hour to make that decision. But I was uh, a little bit surprised. That's if I think maybe you might be generous to say that the NFL made the decision. I think the decision was made for them by the people at Paycor stadium, most notably the bills and the Bengals. Emphasis True. on the bills. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. But in the end, that was what was decided, and it wasn't forced to play the game on Tuesday or later in the sure. week. Theoretically, the NFL could have said, okay, Bills, you don't want to play or you can't play because you're in, you're grieving, uh, you forfeit. So I guess the NFL technically could have been a hard ass about it. Uh, well, and so just the precedent is that the game does continue. You know, Dane Jackson, which is a different injury in a different situation, but when he was taken off the field in an ambulance, I don't know if there was any thought to suspending that game. It was just kind of line them up and let's go. And then it, it, many other instances over the years of of serious uh, neck injuries and head injuries. Kevin Everett and, right there in Orchard Park sure. also. And even, and I'm forgetting the player's name, but the Detroit Lions player in 1971 that actually did die on the field. They finished that game. That's just how the NFL historically has treated these situations. And, you know, I, I kind of thought that was going to, be another case of this and you saw the expressions and the emotional response from the bills players and even some of the bengals coaches and players and you thought it it doesn't how, what how is this game going to look how are these guys going to be able to play and as you alluded to that that might have bled into this week 18 game against the patriots and you wondered how could the bills emotionally get themselves ready to play this game and i was 
I would have been with you, and I was maybe in agreement with you before the game, that the game shouldn't be played. The Bills shouldn't be forced to play this game if they did not want to play the game. But the sense I got from the press availabilities before and after the game and during the game was that at that point, the Bills did want to play the game. They, they had it in their hearts that it was for DeMar Hamlin and that they wanted to play the game. And I think it was a big moment, not that this is the most important characters in this story, but it was a big moment for the city and the fans in that it was very cathartic that the Bills were able to come out, play the game, win the game, have a, a positive. I think that's experience. rationalization. I think that that is after the fact, not just the win, but I'll go back to the Tuesday afternoon following DeMar Hamlin's cardiac arrest, in which he is still laying unconscious and on a ventilator at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center when the NFL released a statement saying that Week 18 schedule remains unchanged. And so that game was going to be played, at least on the surface. The NFL didn't give any caveats or asterisks to their, to their announcement. But the NFL was going to play those games regardless of whether DeMar Hamlin was going to wake up or not. At 1 o'clock on Sunday, the Bills were going to kick off against the New England Patriots. And I think that at one Bills drive while they're worried about their teammate and if he's going to make it or not. And they didn't really find out until Wednesday night. And that is when uh, DeMar Hamlin's father uh, told the Bills to go ahead and get back to their objectives, move on, it's okay. Yes. So they were given a, a, the blessing of uh, from DeMar Hamlin's family to move on with the game. And then by Thursday, word had gotten around that DeMar Hamlin was un, was was conscious and was looking like he was going to be OK. And so then and I use the phrase in my column about this, it's was retrofitting the rationalization of playing the game. I, I think that the NFL needed to be. Uh, uh I guess I'll use the phrase because I can't think of a better one. The adult in the room and say, you guys don't have to worry about playing this week. You don't have to worry about looking for reasons or justifications to play this game because DeMar Hamlin's father wants you to, which a lot of fathers would, you know, they want meaning in, in what their son just went through. They, the, the, the sports ethic uh, or ethos uh, moving, you know, moving forward, got to keep at it, boys go out there and win one for DeMar. And mental health be damned. I think that the team needed a break last week. They would they had to have been exhausted uh, from not sleeping. They they certainly didn't prepare uh, as optimally as they could have for that game. Now they ended up winning it because they are much better than the New England Patriots. And I think that they beat the New England Patriots eight or nine times out of ten um, without any issue. And they were trailing in the third quarter of that game to the Patriots. So they did have a, a moment where it seemed like they hit a wall. And if not for Naheem Hines returning two touchdowns for, uh, for uh, two kickoffs for touchdowns, uh, we may be thinking about this differently, but <clears throat> excuse me. And I know I'm going on and on because I wrote a column about it. So all this stuff's kind of fresh off my head, but I do think that the NFL uh, could have done the bills, um, d done them proper by just canceling the game, let the winning percentage factor into the playoff seating. That means the Patriots make the playoffs and the Dolphins don't or whatever. I, I don't care. The Bills already have handily beaten any of the teams they could have played in the first round anyway. And now here they are going into the playoffs, certainly uplifted by what's happened since DeMar Hamlin. But have they really recovered from what happened in Cincinnati? I don't know. They'd have to uh, talk to us and tell us how they feel for us to understand that. And, you know, while I do in many ways agree and empathize with your point about not forcing the Bills to play that game, I didn't hear too much or even much whispering out of the Bills team and locker room that there were players hesitant and didn't want to play. And maybe there were, but we didn't. They didn't give us a lot of players of to talk to and they didn't allow us in the locker room. Yeah, but even even a leak or certain players that and I hope that at the very least, this option was given to individual players to maybe opt out of the game. And if it was too much for them, that they didn't have to play on an individual basis. And that maybe if there was some, 
practice squad call up exceptions or ways that the Bills could have played that game without forcing every individual player to play that game would have been the humane way to handle it. But what I'm saying is, you know, I spent several hours before the game with my job with the AP walking around the parking lots and getting the scene. I'm sure many you you probably did and many of us did. But it just felt like that was an important event for the fan base and the Bills culture. And a lot of that came from the positive developments in DeMar Hamlet's health. It would have been a much different scene if he was still uh, not doing well or if, if that had, you know, been a tragic event in the end. It would have been a much different emotional tenor, a much different scene. And I don't know if the game should have been played if DeMar Hamlin was still in critical condition and we weren't sure if he was going to make it. I was it told from a, a bill source who not only do I trust but would know this information – that if DeMar Hamlin had not regained consciousness, that the Bills probably wouldn't have played the game and would have taken a forfeit if that's what it came to. Right. So with with that being a much more positive situation health-wise for DeMar Hamlin by Sunday, and I think even the emotional health of the Bills got a big lift from DeMar Hamlin's physical health improving, and it seemed like they did want to get back to playing football because that's a step towards uh, normalcy, even if it's a, as you said, a rationalization. I think many people wanted it to go in that direction, and when it was following along along that narrative, people were very excited to celebrate Demar Hamlin and, and have a football game. You know, this is a team that this was only the seventh home game of the season, eight if you count the preseason. They hadn't been home in a couple weeks. Um, I think that just having that end of the season celebration it almost felt like a senior day type atmosphere for at a college or high school and everybody with their homemade signs and jerseys and it's a little bit trivializing it to say that the bills won made it a, a better occasion but it did that kickoff return is a memorable event in bills and buffalo sports history even nfl history that'll be replayed and remembered long after uh you know we're debating the details of whether the Bills should play or whether rules should change or how the playoff seating was formatted. And in the end, it could have been a, a regrettable decision to play that game, but in the end, it turned out to work out. It seemed like it, it was the right emotional experience for everyone involved. Yeah. Players want to play. Athletes want to compete. Um, I was reminded uh, of my boxing coverage days of all the times. Well, you don't even need to have covered it or even seen boxing live. You see it on television. If, if you've, if you've been a fan of the sport, um, all the times that the, the fighter argues with the ref right after the fight's been stopped. Uh, why are you stopping the fight? I, I, I'm good. I can still go not even realize that the referee is holding him up, you know, because the instinct is to keep fighting, to keep competing. I can't believe you stopped the fight. How can you possibly stop the fight? Well, you're flat on your back. Um, sometimes people need to be uh, saved from themselves. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, you were in the parking lot. I wasn't. So I want to ask you about that. Um, spoke with Matthew Fairburn from The Athletic. Uh, he was at the game on Sunday to write that story, the bounce back game, uh, the catharsis, the emotional uh, unleashing of angst and support and fandom uh, at um, at Highmark Stadium. Everything that had been pent up over a very tense, pressure packed week uh, with Demar Hamlin uh, and Matthew's sense was people were ready to move on. That yes, there was it. He, you could sense it if you were looking for it, or you could find the people willing to talk about it, but. In walking around the tailgates and outside uh, the stadium, Matthew was saying it felt like a kind of like a regular game uh, against the, the New England Patriots. I mean, so it wasn't like uh, he was saying it was a, you know, a game against the Bears or something, but um, that it just felt like a regular game. And we are sealed away from the crowd in the press box by very thick glass and it mutes all the sounds. And I also, didn't sense a lot, anything extra during the game either. Um, obviously, Naheem Hines kick return at the beginning, a big deal. But if that were a, a kick return to start any game, you know, any game against the Patriots in week eight of, of 2021 
would, would it have been much different? I don't know. And I'm, I'm just at, so I'll ask you, I, I guess my, my setup to this is I got, I got a sense from my own vibe and also talking to Matthew that it seemed as though because DeMar Hamlin was going to be okay, that it was time to turn the page. I didn't get that sense, at least pregame. Okay. Um, and now I don't walk around the parking lots and hang out with the tailgaters every week, but over the years I've, you know, done that for different stories or different reasons, you know, a dozen or so times. And we just, we walk through the parking lots, getting from our cars to the press box when we're there. So you get a little bit of that vibe. And it did feel different to me because it felt more, there was a different emotional tenor. It was more of a positive uplifting event and celebrating DeMar Hamlin and the bills and this story, this situation working out in a positive way. Whereas I think without that, the vibe is usually, you know, it's, it's kill the opposing team's quarterback and it's, you know, we hate the Patriots and uh, you know, signs about Bill Belichick and things like that. And this was much more of a, I, I saw, and there's a lot of kids there, but I, I guess I noticed more kids with DeMar Hamlin's number painted on their face or taking pictures in front of the love for DeMar sign. It just felt like a different vibe. And I think that the sense of moving on, I think came after the game and into this week, but I don't know if I sense that leading into the game. Cause I think a lot of people were looking forward to uh, whatever the bills did to, acknowledge DeMar Hamlin on the scoreboard or really just being out there with their signs and showing love for DeMar Hamlin and the, the Bills team and the players who had an emotional week. And it, it just seemed like a, a very empathic environment. The, a lot of Bills fans were traumatized by watching this on television. And I think everybody in that culture came together and there was a lot of emotional resolution, I think, from playing that game in Buffalo in the way it went and the kick return. Yeah, of course, a kick return to open up the game would have been a huge event, no matter what context of the game. But in this context, it was even bigger. And you don't see a lot of kick return touchdowns anymore with the way they changed the rules. And so that being a much more surprising event, it really did seem like, you know, a lot of people made the reference. It did seem like a scripted scene and that game and that whole experience Sunday, even down to the weather being a little bit nice for this time of year, just seemed like it felt like a three act play. Like, you know, there was a lot of buildup for that Cincinnati Buffalo game and all the meaning behind it football wise. And then something devastating happened and it changed the whole tenor of the story. And then the, it ended with a happy ending and everybody lives happily ever after. And it's all a good feeling. And it really played out much like the way you would script a football story. A happy ending with Robert Kraft in attendance. Sure. And Roger Goodell helicoptering in and out. That's right. He was there. I will say um, one thing. I just want to say one thing about the football aspect of it. Now, if the Bills don't want to play that game or if it was a very difficult emotional situation, the Bills should not have been forced to play the game. The Bengals, too, I think, in their sense there. But football-wise, had the Bills not played that game, it puts them in a situation to maybe be the three seed and possibly have to go back to Cincinnati for that second-round playoff game, which might be a more – re-traumatizing experience than playing that game at home and football wise the bills are in a better position to win that game because that is a home game and had they skipped this week 18 game yeah it would have been a bye week and maybe it would have helped in a lot of ways but i think those emotions that got resolved sunday would still be lingering into this week and that would still be more of a you know coming back from the demar hamlin situation and i think the fact that the bills from a football standpoint were able to put that behind them and now just focus on the dolphins and the playoffs probably benefits them a little bit in a way that wouldn't have been the case if that game wasn't played. Uh, I wrote a story uh, for the athletic that is posting today. We're recording this on uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, but uh, for the story, I interviewed uh, Bill Parcells, uh, Dick Vermeil, and Scotty Bowman. And part of the reason I interviewed Scotty Bowman is he's a former bill season ticket holder. He's can, a bills fan. He watches the games. And of course he's, uh, on 14 Stanley Cups, uh, his name is etched. Uh, but it's a sports psychology story uh, in which I asked them about turning reasons into excuses. And as the Bills head, perhaps exhausted, perhaps frazzled into the postseason, how do you stop yourself from checking out mentally, from feeling, well, this just ain't our year, to 
I can't wait for 2023. Uh, I, you know, all these different human instinctive things that could happen when you deal with trauma, when you deal with so much stress and uh, to a man, they all thought that the bills were going to be able to handle this. Bill Parcells is a huge Sean McDermott fan. Uh, Dick Vermeil also uh, said some things regarding the bills and their makeup uh, character type stuff in which uh, he's been impressed. And Scotty Bowman, um, who went through, um, you can't replicate or you, the, what happened with DeMar Hamlin is borderline unprecedented. Uh, yes, it did happen with Chris Pronger in hockey, that particular injury, but to happen like it did uh, for him to be in the balance, the, in the way it was, the game to be canceled and um, but anyway, Scotty Bowman revisited uh, the Vladimir Konstantinov Slava Fatisov uh, limousine accident, in which uh, Konstantinov uh, was in a coma for two months and suffered brain damage that still to this day uh, forces him to have 24 seven care. Um, and speaking about how uh, how the way your team responds is pretty much already been decided by Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott. It's how your roster's built. It's the care that you take and the guys that you have on your roster. It's weeding out the guys who would be a problem in this situation. It's the culture aspect of it. It's the support. It's the brotherhood, all that type of stuff. So Scotty Bowman had some really um, wise things to say regarding how it, it comes from within. And it's not generally the coach uh, who is going to you know, lead the charge, uh, who is going to, you know, give the great speech or fine tune the perspective, uh, as much as it's going to come from within each individual guy on the roster and the, from within the locker room. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Bill Parcells brought up was uh, a concept, uh, that he referred to as losing respect for winning. And he said uh, that he's had teams that got to, a point in the season where you could tell they felt satisfied that they'd exceeded expectations. Um, we can go ahead and call it a year and still be proud of it. And I think that the bills could do that with everything they've been through the weather, the community stuff. Uh, I don't want to say community stuff because that, that belittles it, but I'll, so I'll spell it out 44 and counting dead from a Christmas winter storm five children in ages for between two and 10 dying in a house fire. Uh, the top shooting in which 10 people were massacred. Uh, the, the owner who has been hospitalized and we don't really know why all the, and hasn't been seen in public since Dawson Knox's brother. Play by play uh, announcer, John Murphy, John Murphy having a stroke um, right before the Bengals game. Um, I think I'm even missing a thing or two, but I think it's human nature that you might want to say <laughs> we survived. We did great. Uh, we, we dealt with a lot of shit. Uh, but Parcells's take was that happens generally with teams that have won the championship. And he thinks that just because he doesn't think that 13 regular season wins uh, is going to be enough for these guys. And uh, so anyways, Give that story a read. Uh, I think it's three very uh, wise, experienced, the most successful of the most successful coaches uh, who who give their overview as to what Buffalo and the Bills have been facing and whether or not uh, they'll hit an emotional wall. Yeah, one thought I had this week uh, coming into this game or coming out of the, the events of the past couple of weeks is that I just felt like all of the the tragedies that Western New York as a community and the people in Western New York have endured over the past year, which I don't really like conflating with football injuries and football situations that I think are not, not the same thing, but it is something that sets the emotional baseline for many people involved in and out of the Bills organization. And yeah. the difficult injuries and illnesses and the demise. Rightly or wrongly. Rightly or wrongly, like you say, it does set the emotional standard. You think you 
take a look at how much money was raised for Damar Hamlin versus the children who died in the house fire or what Thurman and Patty Thomas tried to raise uh, for the uh, the winter storm right uh, recovery. But the real life life or death events surrounding the football team and in this community that have happened in the past year, I think really trivialize things like 13 seconds or losing a football game is not a traumatic experience that there are traumatic experiences related to playing and watching and being emotionally invested in a football team that have nothing to do with whether you win or lose or whether you win the championship. And I, I think this notion that, that existed before the season and in many seasons when the Bills have been contenders that the Bills need to raise the trophy at the end and Super Bowl or bust and this has to end with a Super Bowl championship, I think is the wrong way to look at your favorite team and to experience football. And I think you got to enjoy – the season as it goes along. And if the Bills won 13 regular season games, which ties for the most they've ever won in a season, and they win two or three playoff games, especially these two at home, but they just don't happen to win the last game and, and be Super Bowl champions, I think that's okay. And it's still a great season and it's still a team to be proud of if if you know if you're a Bills fan. It doesn't have to end with the Super Bowl parade for everything to be okay. And on the same, the other side of that token, if the Bills do win the Super Bowl, it doesn't, you know, that doesn't make up for all of the tragic events and the illnesses and the injuries. It might sort of kind of be a nice capstone to the DeMar Hamlet situation, especially if he continues in his recovery and maybe he's on the sideline with confetti falling onto him while they're winning that Super Bowl. But it doesn't make all of the tragedy and the emotional trauma that Buffalo and Western New York has been through over the past year worth it because the Bills win a Super Bowl. But I think there's some football fans that look at it that way. Or that it's deserved. You know, we karma owes us, which was Mark Polencarz's quote in the uh, New York Times story that ran a couple of days after DeMar Hamlin's uh, cardiac arrest. Um, yeah, you, know, you mentioned the Super Bowl, the county and the city still need to be held accountable for their poor storm response. It doesn't make everything OK just because the Bills are the best team in the NFL. You know, you mentioned the trivialization of 13 seconds, and I agree with you, uh, but just something to think about. I'm not throwing it out there for us to discuss because I want to uh, move on. And, oh, by the way, I haven't even mentioned uh, uh, after the break, uh, I'm going to uh, have an interview with uh, Alan Pupar. Uh, he is uh, the publisher of uh, alldolphins.com, longtime uh, friend of mine from my Dolphins uh, beat writing days. Uh, alldolphins.com. You can go directly there or also on the Sports Illustrated Fan Nation Network. Uh, you can see Alan Pupar's work. Uh, he's been on the show before, but uh, we're going to preview uh, Dolphins at Bills, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about Skylar Thompson uh, because, let's face it, we don't know much about the guy. Uh, but um, I know 13 he was seconds. To Walter White. Right, right. Yeah, Heisen, he's the Heisenberg of uh, of NFL quarterbacks. Um, so 13 seconds and it's trivialization. You're absolutely right. Uh, and yet, and yet, we know more about what happened with Damar Hamlin than we do in 13 seconds. We we know in oh, in point. detail uh, Damar Hamlin's health situation. Uh, we know, uh, you know, of all the things that can be private, of course, it happened on national television, but there is a feeling that with the football player, unlike the owner, I don't know what the, the line, there's a line obviously somewhere, but that everybody needs to know exactly what happened with DeMar Hamlin and his recovery, how he was treated. And yes, there are many heroes who deserve uh, to have, uh, have their day in the sun over helping DeMar Hamlin live maybe not even helping the reason he's alive uh, is because of all these uh, uh, very fast thinking men and women who were right there on the scene. But uh, you, you would think or would have thought that asking Sean McDermott in the bills about 13 seconds uh, 10 months ago uh, was as though we were asking personal medical information because the bills wouldn't tell us that. But so maybe, maybe this is a way to, with perspective, maybe someday we'll finally learn about 13 seconds as we 
evolve as humans and find out that uh, it's okay to talk about miscommunication on a kickoff uh, is uh, is not something that needs to be protected at all costs. Right. This is a safe space to talk about football errors and strategy right. errors. Uh, Jonah, before we get to Alan Pupar, um, there's a dustbin of stuff around Western New York that I want to get to. I know that uh, with there's Big Four basketball uh, tidbits, Damon volleyball tidbit, oh, high school girls basketball tidbit. Um we can talk about the Sabres, uh, you know, they're, let, let's save that for uh, early next week. You know, we're going to have Kevin Snow on uh, coming up to talk about his uh, his book that's out. Um, I thought I, I'm looking for it because I thought I had it right here. I was going to show it. But anyway, Kevin's good friend, uh, Kevin Snow, come on the podcast. We'll, we'll have a big hockey episode coming up. Uh, but what's been going on? What's been going on with the local amateur scene? Well, maybe let me start real quick just to make sure we get it in. Uh, you know, three girls basketball players from West New York, seniors, Gretchen Dolan from Williamsville South, Kaylee Kristoff from Depew, and Clara Strack from Hamburg are all nominated for the McDonald's All-American game. Three of 21 girls players in the state, 300-something nationally, and there are no boys players nominated. And that's it's quite an achievement for those girls, but I think it's it's quite a – achievement for West New York basketball. They have three in the same year. You know, there have been McDonald's all American nominees. There's usually maybe one every other year between the boys and the girls. There was one last year, a girl, Shea Shashki, and, and there's some girls that are sophomores and juniors that'll probably be in this position the next year, but to have that many in one year and that many in a three, four year period, Amari DeBerry was actually a McDonald's all American two years ago. She's now playing at UConn. There's only been three, McDonald's All-Americans on the boys' side, and the last one was Johnny Flynn in 2007. So it's a rare achievement. I don't know if any of these girls are actually going to be McDonald's Americans, McDonald's All-Americans, but they are to be nominated and to be considered and to be – they're all Division One players. You asked me on our previous podcast maybe, you know, what sport's producing the most Division One recruits, and women's basketball is having a, a big moment. There's a lot of – there's a number of Division One players from West New York now. There's going to be even more next year, and there's going to be even more in the years coming after that. And if you get a chance, especially this Gretchen Dolan, she's scoring 40 points a game. Her brother Greg Dolan was a great player around here, and he's playing at Cornell now. If you get a chance to go out and watch any of these players, um, you know, on the girls' side this year, and even going into next year, there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of, um, you know, good teams and good players to watch maybe as you get into the sectionals in March. Does that uh, seep over into – the big four women's college teams here. Well, it hasn't none, seemed of, the, to none yet. of these girls, well, they don't stick around. Not really. Some of them do. I mean, Danny Haskell, who is the all time leading scorer in Western New York from Franklinville is playing at Canisius. Now um, there are, I mean, there's five girls from O'Hara on the Niagara team and two of them, Angel Parker and Aaliyah Parker were player of the year caliber players, one player of the year. I don't believe they were ever McDonald's all American nominees, but they were, pretty close in ability to these girls that have achieved that status. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that has more to do with the strength of the local programs. I mean, if, if UB was really rolling like they were in the past couple of years, then maybe they would have a better chance of getting these girls, but it's still the conference affiliation and, you know, uh, Gretchen Dolan's going to Illinois and Clara Strack's going to Virginia Tech. And Kaylee Kristoff's going to Binghamton, which is a little bit of the same level, but they have kind of a pipeline recruiting this area. There's another girl from Amherst, Ella Wanzer, that's already out there. Um, so I, I think that's more about the, the local teams and how well they're the, – the status of their programs and how well they're recruiting. But the, just to mention real quick, the women's basketball team at University of Buffalo was supposed to have a really tough rebuilding year with losing their entire roster – replacing it with a lot of transfers. Some of these girls got hurt or didn't really, you know, they're down to, I think, about 10 active players on the team, and they were struggling at the very beginning. They lost to Canisius for the first time in 10 years. But now they've won five of their last six. They're really playing well. Becky Burke has that team, um, and she's done a great coaching job in getting that team competitive. There are a lot of fifth-year seniors that won't be here next year, but they're playing hard, and they're playing for themselves and their teammates. And it's just been kind of impressive to see that what was supposed to be a really 
difficult rebuilding year for UB is turning into a, they, you know, they have a winning record and might finish with a winning record. And then I want to make a point to mention uh, Damon men's volleyball division two program defeats Princeton preseason ranked uh, in the nation division one, uh, by the way. Um, what is it about Damon's program? Uh, it's been a pretty cool thing, a, a pretty cool under the radar uh, sports program in, in, in Western New York over the last few years. And we've talked about it actually on the show before and, and how they've brought in big programs. Um, but, uh, I mean, catch me up on them. I, I don't know much more beyond the fact that they, that they beat Princeton, but w- what's, what's going on with that? Why they're, they're to, they, it's remain, not only remaining a thing, it seems to be working. Right. It's in their fifth year. And last year they were 16 and eight and they reached the finals of something called the independent volleyball association tournament because they were an independent, they weren't in a conference. They didn't have an opportunity to, they could have been an at large team, but they didn't have an opportunity to get an uh, automatic bid into the NCAA tournament in men's volleyball. The NCAA tournament is division one and division two. And it turns out to be mostly division one teams, but there are some division two teams that win their conference and get in uh, and and are able to get in. And because there are very few teams, I think it's somewhere around 40 or less uh, men's volleyball scholarship programs in the country, the Division II teams are more like mid-major Division I teams in another sport, the talent and the ability to recruit. And a lot of them are players that transferred down from Division I, especially some of Damon's best players. So there's a lot more parity between Division I and Division II with that sport which you see in something like Damon beating Princeton, who was an NCAA tournament team last year and a nationally ranked team coming into the season. They ended up losing to number four Penn State, but they're able to play with these teams that in some other sports, uh, you know, that's a lot harder to do, especially for Division II Damon would not be able to compete very well against Penn State in basketball, but it can happen in volleyball. And Damon's now in a conference. So that's another step up. If If they can win the conference, they can make it to the, Division One NCAA tournament, and I don't know. Might be a stretch to say a Division Two team like Damon could win the national championship, but it's closer. Obviously, Division Two Damon's never going to win a Division One championship in basketball, but it's closer in that sport than any other sport. That if they got the right group of players and the right team in the right season, a team like Damon could make a run to the Division One national championship in a way that's just not possible in any other sport. Um, so it's kind of a neat thing to watch how that happens. It's and I'll fantastic. tell you this, because I didn't go to the game against Princeton. There was a Sabres game that night. But I went three years ago when they played UCLA, which was number two in the country at the time. And a number of these UCLA players were Olympic volleyball players, Olympic program volleyball players. And seeing that up close, that sport, the the height that these players jump and how hard they hit the ball, how, you know, just how – you watch volleyball and you don't really think it's a dangerous sport. And then you watch the high level men's volleyball and how hard they spike their body. It's like, I don't want to, did get they play that, that in the Damon gym? Yeah, they played in the Damon. Gym. So it's if you're, so gym. if you're in attendance at that game, you got to look out. Right. I mean, I sat at press row and I was, I had my head and my eyes moving <laughs> a lot more than I do at a basketball game. You're right on the court. Sure I didn't get hit with a ball. And, uh, it was just amazing to see that up close. And you can probably get some of the same sense just by watching Damon play another team in its conference, but playing the number two team in the country and some of these guys that are Olympic volleyball players, it was pretty wild to see that, uh, you know, right up close live in the flesh in Western New York. And the fact that they can bring teams like this into their gym, you know, UB played UConn who ended up being, you know, a number two ranked team in the country, but they're not bringing UConn here. That happened many years ago with, you know, when Reggie Witherspoon was the coach of UB, they played UConn as the number two team and Pitt as the number two team at various points in the 2000s. But that doesn't happen anymore. But if you are a volleyball fan, you know, Damon's going to be able to bring in some of the premier volleyball teams to play in this gym maybe once a year. And, you know, I maybe recommend checking that out the next time that comes along on the schedule uh, next year or in the future. I, I, on my clutter, uh, cluttered desk here, I was finally able to locate uh, Kevin Snow's book, The Science of Hockey. 
which I have read. Math, technology, and data behind the sport. I don't want to cover up Kevin's name here. Um, you'll see that the forward is by John Vogel. But you'll also see that the main blurb is from the athletics Tim Graham. How about, How about that, that shit? I read that book, and I will say to plug it real quick. I enjoyed it because I thought it was going to be all about analytics and the math of the game, and it's really not. The, no, there's, there's a chapter about that, and there's aspects of that, but it's a it's lot about of interesting like, stuff, like physical science. It's a deep dive into things like the perfect rink temperature and what makes a great sheet of ice, how you put the ice down. And uh, I said it in my blurb because uh, I was given the, the book ahead of time so I could give a statement, you know, give a comment on it. And um, it, it's, it, it answers questions you didn't even know you had. You're like, right. you start your reading and you keep reading and you're like, yeah, how does that happen? And then two paragraphs later, he starts to answer it. And you're like, yeah, holy shit. So um, obviously highly yeah, recommend There's a lot of. Kevin was supposed to be on last week, and of course, thing, the book just went on sale. So um, I'm sorry, Jonah, I talked over you. No, no, no. And, and then I talked over myself. I say maybe we should just save this for the podcast when Kevin comes on. But there's a lot of physics with the game of hockey that maybe you take for granted, that players on skates and with sticks uh, sliding around, and you just think that's the way they play the game. But there's a lot of physics involved in the, how the game is played in those conditions that are different from – you know, running around playing a different game with like lacrosse, which I'm covering tonight with the Buffalo Bandits. Well, Jonah, thanks for this. Um, do we want to mention the Sabres really quickly just because they're coming into the midway point of the season? They're on a three game skid. If they lose tonight, it'll be a four game skid. Um, you know, how do you feel about the Sabres and their potential to turn this around? Uh, I. D <laughs> my questions are still the same and it's about the goaltending and with Comrie coming back and Ukapeka Lukanen was sick there and he missed a game. And it seems as though just as the goaltending was finally starting to give me at least a sense of consistency or rhythm that it's just been thrown out of whack again, it's discombobulated. And, uh, that obviously is, is a big factor is why they're they're uh, they've lost three in a row. Uh, the goal, the goal scoring is still generally there. I also realized that I use the word generally a lot, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to endeavor to eliminate that or, or reduce its usage. Um, you know, if we had a podcast producer, you could just have him punch out generally every time. <laughs> I don't know that you'd have to find that. It's not, it, it's not like a, a, um, a control F and you can just find every instance where I say generally and put in a different word uh, in print. Um, so you think that the producer would go back and listen to every second of this and wait for me to say generally and, and take it out. Uh, How much yeah, do you think there, we would pay on this the technology? There could probably be a uh, yeah. transcription program that would find it too. How much would we be paying this fictional producer uh, who, uh, who would who would have nothing better to do than to go back and listen and, and take out every here's time how it works generally you'd have to pay them like five dollars for every time you say generally and then when you get hit with that bill one time you'll stop saying generally <laughs> yeah you're right that would work that would work uh all right uh we're gonna talk to uh alan pupar uh right after this ctbk is more than just a full service accounting firm they are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome back to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants, as promised. Alan Pupar, he is the publisher of alldolphins.com. Check out his work there. 
also part of the Sports Illustrated Fan Nation Network. And we've had Alan on the show before. And, uh, of course, things have changed quite a bit since we've had Alan on. Not only is it playoff time, so the stakes are higher, but uh, the Dolphins will look a little different, uh, especially on offense. Uh, Alan, I guess, you know, I think that the Bills, with the exception of their emotional state and everything that they've been through as a team and through the community, you kind of know what you're going to get with the Buffalo Bills. They're pretty healthy. Uh, they uh, Their key positions are going to be held down by the people who've been there essentially all season, with the exception of, you know, Von Miller, but they've been without him since Thanksgiving. Uh, but Tua Tangovaloa, not in uh, this game and maybe not any future game uh, this playoff season if the Dolphins were able to even advance because as we're recording this on Friday afternoon, he's still not cleared to practice. So uh, what is your assessment of this Dolphins offense with Skylar Thompson? Yeah, it's not, not quite the same. Uh, here's the thing, though. The, there was some good news, as you mentioned, we're taping this on Friday afternoon, which was the day Teron Armstead returned to practice for the first time in three weeks. And I have been pounding the table for a long, long time in maintaining my position that he is maybe as significant to the success, as important to the success of the Dolphin offense as even Tua. Because if you look at, and I, I love how everybody does a comparison to Dolphin offense with or without Tua. And my initial thought is like, Go ahead and look what it looks like with or without Teron Armstead. And there's the same kind of drop off. And just looking at the games too, when he's not in the lineup, it's just, it's not the same. So he's not, he's a guy who's dealing, uh, what's he got now? Toe, pec, knee, and hip injuries. And it's a struggle for him to be able to play. He revealed to us this week that he was advised to have surgery after week one when he sustained the toe injury which would have knocked him up for the season. And against that advice, he decided to tough it out and play. And then through the course of the season, it's been one, one thing after another. Um, but he, if he's able to play on Sunday, it changes what the Dolphin offense is going to look like. And if anybody's going to go by what they looked like against the Jets last Sunday, yeesh, that was not pretty. But they were playing the Jets. How much did they really need to do offensively against the Jets, whose offense was basically on the same level with three backup starting on a bad offensive line to begin with. So they didn't do, do much. They didn't ask Skylar Thompson to do much, but he's shown enough. But they had to do enough to win. It's not like that the Dolphins were saving something for the Bills, right? Oh, absolutely. They were saving a lot of things for the Bills. They they basically weren't worried about the Jets being able to hurt them, so they weren't taking chances. I think like – Cutting it command, awful close. Oh, they, they cut it close. But command number one to, to Skylar Thompson in that game was don't mess up, don't turn the ball over. I think against the Bills, it may be more along the lines of, you, dude, you got to make some plays. And I am of the belief that they actually could be able to get some things done offensively. Now, they're probably not going to have Raheem Mostert uh, at running back. That's not going to help. Obviously, he had the big game against the Bills at Highmark Stadium on that, on that uh, December Saturday night. Um, but this is where the Dolphins are, right? I mean, they have four offensive linemen on the injury report, along with two, along with Raheem Mostert. Um, but it's not a lost cause. I don't want to make it sound like, for example, I mean, San Francisco is starting a rookie seventh round pick in the playoffs. And I don't, I don't think anybody over there is fretting about Brock Purdy being in the lineup, except they're loaded everywhere else. The Dolphins yeah, are well, not. The thing, but we've seen Brock Purdy do it for a few weeks, whereas Skylar Thompson, we don't have that recall of seeing a spectacular play or even – a methodical orchestration of a long touchdown drive or anything like that. We don't really have that in our memory banks that you can with Purdy. And I think that the 49ers obviously are a better team all around. Uh, but I, I want to just uh, stay on Armstead for a second. Four, four Pro Bowls for this guy uh, with the New Orleans Saints. And then, of course, this year, also a Pro Bowl selection for the Dolphins there at left tackle. Uh, I we're not allowed in practice this time of year. Uh, that's something that teams rarely do. Some still allow it, but uh, I, I doubt that Mike McDaniels is uh, letting you, uh, you know, peer through the uh, Venetian blinds and, and watch practice. 
What can you expect, though, from Armstead? Because you did mention he has 43 things uh, on the injury report, uh, including, I think, he was just removed from having been on an iron lung. Uh, but he's going to play, theoretically. So what can you expect from him, though? Well, I don't even know that he's going to play. I mean, all I said well, is right. he returned to practice, which which it's a good is sign and all hands on deck. Yeah. And he spoke to us on Wednesday because we gave him the good guy award uh, for the Dolphins for 2022. And he basically said, if I can't function, it's not an issue of pain tolerance. If I can't function, I'm not going out there. So if I, if I can play, I can do what I can. Um, what can he do? I, I think he can be, let's say a 50% to Ron Armstead is still better than it's probably still the best off- offensive lineman on this team. Um, and that's the thing. And I also think he brings, that's going to sound weird, like a peace of mind and some kind of calming effect, calming influence on the rest of the line. I mean, he's the old guy who knows what he knows what he's doing. Uh, he's been there for a while. And I think just having him there just makes a big difference. Um, maybe even in the play, in the play calling as well. So, uh, even if it may not be like vintage to Ron Armstead, who at his best is a top five, if not top three left tackle in the NFL. Um, j- just having him there is good. Will, will make a difference. Right? There's no question about that. What's the scouting report on Skylar Thompson? Because uh, Bills fans have been watching their team play. And unless you have the NFL Sunday ticket and maybe you record those games, you're probably not dissecting too much Skylar Thompson as a Dolphin. Um Maybe you remember him from Kansas State. Uh, if you're a Bills fan, so what would be the uh, the thumbnail on Skylar Thompson for the casual Bills fan or the casual NFL fan who is tuning into this game and doesn't know where to start? Gamer, um, I, I, I hate to men- I, I hate to mention the name because I and some now somebody is going to start thinking, oh, you're comparing him to that guy. No. He's got like some of the same characteristics like of Joe Burrow, where you look at him like, is there anything that Joe Burrow does great? Not really, but there, there's just, it, you know, the, the sum of everything he does and the moxie that he has just adds up to like, you know, an elite franchise quarterback. Kyle Thompson's not an elite franchise quarterback, but it's he's got the same thing of like, he can do a little bit of everything. He can move out of the pocket. He can scramble and make plays. He will stand in the pocket and take a hit to make a throw. He has the ability to make the, the big time throw, but he's he's still a rookie seventh round pick. And there are a lot of Dolphin fans who are harping on a fourth down play last week against the Jets, where he had Tyreek Hill flash open for I don't know one, two, three seconds maybe, and he didn't quickly, you know, get him the ball there and wound up like going to another read and eventually pressure got to him and threw the ball away. Well, he's a seventh round pick, and those things are going to happen. They happen even to good quarterbacks. Um, but he's tough. He's a gamer. Um, and there, there's he, he's got the ability to, to do things off schedule, which is, for example, I, I hate to say it, but it's not necessarily Tua's forte. Tua, Tua is all about rhythm, timing, precision, and all that, whereas Thompson is more, okay, let me let me see what's going on here, and then I'll figure something out. He was considered a bit of a dual threat quarterback coming out of Kansas State, but hasn't really shown that too much uh, with the Dolphins. Not that there's been a large enough body of work, but uh, with uh, anything goes when it comes to the postseason, your thoughts on him as a as a runner? No, he's effective. They they haven't done anything for him in terms of design runs, but he he's got some he's got some good scrambles when the pocket has collapsed. I remember there was a game. Was it against New England? It was against New England, in fact, um, when they wound up losing. But one of the key plays of the game, on his first drive after the Dolphins gave up the pick six, they drove into New England territory, and then they were facing, I think it was a third down, and he scrambled, picked up the first down, and it was it would have been a huge play in the game, except that the play was negated because Tyreek Hill was flagged for, illegal, for an illegal shift. And on the next play, he threw behind Hill, who – popped up the ball and it was picked off and then it went downhill from there. Um, and it wasn't the only, the first time that he's shown some things with his scrambling ability. I think it's definitely, you know, something that he has that he can, you know, get things done with. It, it wouldn't surprise me if he picked up two or three first downs on Sunday with his scrambling. 
And you think, uh, you know, Mostert, of course, he had the thumb surgery. He hasn't been ruled out, but that seems like a pretty daunting thing for a running back when you're thinking about anything from ball security or being a threat to catch the ball out of the backfield. Uh, the, the speed obviously is there and he's been dynamic, but is there, is there any optimism at all with, with him playing on Sunday? No, I mean, before practice Friday, Mike McDaniel was asked about his status and he he did decline to def- definitively rule him out, but was saying like some we're still looking at some things, see if we can make some things work. But like you like you said, I mean, he's a running back. They have their fullback Alec Ingles already playing with a cast or with a club on his hand the past two games. Uh, but what he's, what he's asked to do is block. So, and then there was one play where against New England, Teddy Bridgewater got out of the pocket and could find nobody to run to, to pass to, and instead of taking a sack, wound up like you know, ditching it to, to angle to like basically was trying to fumble it, catching it with one hand because you couldn't do anything with the other hand. So, and with most you're going to ask him to carry the ball and he catch passes out of the backfield, which he did so well last week and got, you know, some good yak. So it's, I have a very hard time seeing him in the lineup. I've already done it once. Um, so I, I want to just mention real quick. I do know that his name is Mike McDaniel. Uh, I said Mike McDaniels earlier because of Josh McDaniels, and I have a mental hangup with that. And you may have had this too, Alan, because it's similar to me. It's reminiscent of when Tony Sperano was the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. And then if you tried to talk about the television show, I had trouble saying Tony Soprano because my brain was so I would in conversation about the TV show. I kept calling him Tony Sperano. So anyway, you get used to it. I'm more used to Josh McDaniels. And when the name, when the name McDaniel, when the first, however many letters come out of my, come out of my head, I add the S to it. I don't know. I just want to apologize to anybody out there. And I want to say that I do know that it's Mike McDaniel. No, I had the same issue this week, which was the score, the final score of the Dolphins Jets game because of that stupid safety on the last play of the game, which was added after the fact. So I kept running nine six nine six nine six when the final score actually I know was eleven six. Speaking of uh, Mike McDaniel, uh, are we going to yeah. need to memorize his name as Dolphins head coach? Um, I, we're getting ahead of ourselves because we're scouting the uh, we're scouting this game on Sunday. We're handicapping a little bit, but what do you make of him as the future of the Miami Dolphins as the head coach? Because we know of all the flirtations that Steven Ross has had, even with successful coaches, even with Tony Sperano going after John Harbaugh. That's another one, by the way. I always have to stop for a beat and figure out if I'm going to say John or Jim. No, he went with, he went after Jim Harbaugh when he had Tony Sperano. Did I say John? You did. You did. Damn John. it. I scr- All right. Damn it. Okay. So, yeah, he went after Jim Harbaugh. He went out to Stanford. I do know the difference between John and Jim, so I'll just describe the, the scene. Uh, He went out to Stanford to talk to Stanford head coach, former 49ers head coach, Jim Harbaugh, (laughs) with Tony Sperano looking out his picture window uh, with his hand pressed up against it, waiting for Stephen Ross to come home in the Dolphins jet uh, to find out if he still had a job. Uh, Of course, the Sean Payton stuff. Um, What what are your thoughts on, on Mike McDaniel? I'm going to will it. I'm just going to say the name so, so many times that, but stop me if I ever get it wrong. Don't you, I have to be trained. I'm like a dog on it with a treat. You have to train me. Uh, But what does this mean for Mike McDaniel? Do you think, Uh, does he have to win in the playoffs? Does it matter? Is he set or gone one way or the other? Can we read Stephen Ross's mind by this time? I was was going to say, Tim, I think you and I have followed this guy long enough to know, Expect the unexpected, right? Can we rule out anything with with Stephen Ross? Uh, can we say for a fact he's not going to like you know repeat the the Sean Payton Tom Brady uh, pursuit? Except now now he doesn't have any any first round picks to give to the Saints if that's what they want as compensation for for letting Sean Payton leave and sign with some some other team. And let me throw another wrinkle in there. And I know I'm overloading the question here to you, Alan, but it's a conversation. We'll kick it back and forth. Tua Tungavaloa's concussion issues, I think you could probably 
rationalized them away a couple of weeks ago as maybe a little fluky or they got a little careless with the first concussion or what happened with the bills and coming back and then the follow-up against the Bengals. But now here's a guy with multiple concussions within the same season. You can rationalize moving on from a guy who was in the MVP conversation to Tom Brady, I think, or at least you could sell it. You can get there because you can say, I don't, we don't know if, if Tua is, is a, a viable quarterback in the NFL much longer. Oh, so you no. can even justify the Tom Brady aspect of it, let alone the, the Sean Payton part or going after Jim Harbaugh again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just stop there for a second. Go. I did. I have every every freaking time. Um, yeah, and there's always a, the Stephen Ross Jim Harbaugh connection from from their University of Michigan ties. Like I said, I, I don't put anything past Stephen Ross. Uh, they're going to do wild and crazy stuff. He's an owner who desperately wants to win, hasn't been able to do that with the Dolphins. And here's the thing, too. Uh, because even the, no, the notion even of even talking about Mike McDaniel's job security sounds ridiculous considering the dude just made the playoffs in his first year. But so did Tony Sperano in 2008. And, so he did be, and he should be talked about as coach of the year uh, because of everything that the Dolphins did have to go through because of the upheaval and the owner being suspended and the fact that he wasn't the first choice and that the quarterback, uh, he's... Yeah, I think he should be just like Tony Sperano was. Uh, he was second to Mike Smith, I believe, for coach of the year in his first year um, as Dolphins coach with the Wildcat well, and all that fun stuff. But no, I was going to say that the, the Bill Parcells aura probably cost Tony Sperano the coach of the year in 2008. I think this this idea that Parcells was calling all the shots behind the scenes. So, um no, you certainly could make a case. And the problem, the problem with Mike McDaniel as coach of the year and as as completely being locked, and beyond the fact that Stephen Ross likes shiny toys. Let's not kid ourselves. He likes the shiny toys. This is why you got you wind up getting Mike Wallace and Dominican Sue in Miami, why he pursued Tom Brady and all that. The fact that they were eight and three, wound up nine and eight and barely making the playoffs. Not great. Uh, can the argument be made that there was a lack of adjustment once defenses figured out how to stop this Dolphin offense, how to keep Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell from getting wide open 15 yards on the middle of the field for easy pitch and catch with Tua? Um, having said all that, he still made the playoffs. And, and the, here's the thing: they were also they were nine and eight this year. Last I checked, oh, they were nine and eight last year also. It's just that they made the playoffs this year because of. You know, they won the tiebreaker last year. They didn't. Um, so um, I would expect Mike McDaniel to be back in 2023. But I, I certainly wouldn't be surprised and probably not even a little bit if Stephen Ross wound up for, you know, going for a big fish. And I think that we can't um, assume that the ownership brotherhood uh, will – be able to talk him into anything much like we see with Dan Snyder in Washington. And there are, there are ways that the NFL machine cannot uh, necessarily get its owners in line, but I think it would be fascinating if Steven Ross dismisses two coaches of color in back-to-back -back seasons uh, when they had done pretty well, they had winning records and they were both dismissed um, at a time when the NFL is, well, I mean, but here's, right. here's you're, you're, shake, you're yeah, shaking your head there, yeah, but I, I it, what I'm saying is that. you're right. The NFL doesn't care about that, but it is to normal people, I think, a bad look. Except, in the, and this is where this is where the Brian Flores lawsuit was a little bit weird to me because at the time he files a lawsuit, the Dolphins, I believe, may have been the only team in the NFL who had a black head coach, black general manager, black assistant general manager. Um, and you know, general manager is still Chris Greer. The assistant general manager is still, Mar still Marvin Allen. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. And I think owners would know. I, I, I'm not. I don't know that I'd buy that angle. I, I think owners know Stephen Ross better than than it, that he's a guy who just likes. Again, he likes the big fish. He likes the shiny toy. That and that would be, that would be the issue. Because again, if that if if you're bringing up the racism angle, then why would he hire Mike McDaniel in the first place? 
Well, you could you could say that it's because the spotlight was so bright and all, the coaching carousel had stopped in many ways that because of the Brian Flores lawsuit, it was a way to save face. Mm, okay. I, yeah, I, from a PR standpoint, take a look at you know, just PR standpoint. I don't think that the NFL has come crashing down or the Fritz Pollard Alliance or anything like that. We haven't heard from John Wooten, uh, but in general, people are looking askance at what's happened in Houston with firing back to back uh, coaches of color. And those records would suggest they deserve to be fired, at least based on the record not based on the fact that you're supposed to get some time to do the job. And historically speaking, based on the research and the Washington post did some great, uh, did a great series on that, that coaches of color don't get as long to prove themselves and they don't get a second chance like white coaches do. Uh, But in Houston, the performances have been deplorable. uh, Whereas in Miami, they've won. So if they can get the, if they can face the heat in Houston, I would think that you would face the heat in Miami. Yeah. Except there are two different circumstances there. And then that number one, the David Crawley one was completely ridiculous because he was given nothing to work with and lo and behold, it completely sucked. Well, what did you, and he wasn't considered really head coaching material to begin with based on people because he came from the bills coaching staff a few years ago. He was unimpressive there. The players who played for him just didn't quite get what, why this guy was considered uh, a coach on the rise. And he really wasn't, he'd stalled out Uh, and he was hired to be fired. Yeah. But in the case of Brian Flores, to to me, it seems pretty obvious that the reason he was fired is because there was a complete lack of, of what's the word I'm looking for cohesion, a in the vision for the team and all that. Like even for example, in 2019, for example, uh, and this showed up in the, in, in his lawsuit where Stephen Ross supposedly joking or, or offered him to like incentives to lose, where it's clear that the Dolphins were not competing. And then they go ahead and sign Ryan Fitzpatrick, which which boggles the mind if you're trying to, to if, if it's a complete rebuild year where you're scrapping everything while you sign a guy who can win you some games makes zero sense. And then Brian Forrest puts Fitzpatrick in the lineup instead of playing Josh Rosen, who I'm going to guess probably would have secured you the first overall pick and they would have had Joe Burrow and that would have been the end of it. And then there were all, all sorts of issues like the last couple of years with Tua when they they have this public pursuit and public flirtation with Deshaun Watson, uh, which comes from where? Is, is it Flores? And then it's not, now it's, coming, it's being like projected that Flores couldn't stand Tua as a quarterback and all that. I don't think it's Brian Flores by himself who was was going out and doing the flirtation with Deshaun Watson, and there was a complete disconnect between the bunch, and that's what wound up getting Flores fired more so than I think any racial issue. Again, the general manager is black for Christ's sake. Right. Um, I didn't mean to go off on such a detour uh, away from talking about Bills Dolphins, so let's get back to the game. Yeah, that's going to have a big impact on Sunday. Right. Well, I, it will be a storyline. I think I, you will be, they'll be talking about it on the broadcast. I'm sure. Um, as they show the close up of Mike McDaniel on the sideline, uh, regardless of how the game is going, I'm sure it'll be mentioned, uh, what his, uh, what his future is or the, the ownership situation. There'll probably be a shot of, uh, Steven Ross in, in a box somewhere. Um, but um, even, even, I don't think it even should be an issue. I mean, the, the guy made the playoffs in his first year. Why? Other than the fact that you have an owner de- desperate, I mean, with a capital capital D to like win because he's not getting any younger. Outside of that, why would there be any issue about Mike McDaniel coming back next year? I, I It's kind of weird to me. Well, that's the real. Oh, yeah. We're, we're I'm, the reason we're talking about it is because of Stephen Ross. It's not for any any deficiency uh, on Mike McDaniel's part. And yes, you you ran through some reasons as to why, as a Dolphins fan, people might be disappointed in Mike McDaniel down the home stretch. Uh, but he's a first year head coach, and that's the stuff that's supposed to happen. Uh, if he was maybe a Mike Shanahan, or I don't know. Uh, throw throw out any name of a, of a guy who's been there, done that, and he hasn't been able to adjust, then okay. But he's a rookie head coach and a young one at that. Mm-hmm. Um, 
unlike David Cully, uh, you know, to be a rookie head coach and have to wait so long. This is a guy who's young and doing it. Um, he's got to be able to learn on the job for a few years. That's how that's how great coaches come to be. Um, but um, I had another point I was going to make, but let's let, let me get back to the game. Um, defense, uh, Dolphins defense against Bill's offense. Um, what is the strength there? Because so much of the conversation is about Tua. It's about Waddle and Hill. Um, it's about Mike McDaniel, the mad genius and his offense. But what about the Dolphins defense? And Bill's fans have seen them twice already. But where are they as somebody who watches them on a on a week to week basis? How has their evolution um where where is their evolution now heading into the postseason? Okay, here's what you have with the Dolphin defense. You have a you have right now a defense that basically nobody can run against. The only the only issue they have in run defense is quarterbacks. And that could come into play with Josh Allen, and that's one of the keys for the Dolphin defense. But but running backs themselves, I mean, they've they stuffed Nick Chubb, they stuffed Aaron Jones, um, they stuffed Ramondre Stevenson. They will they they have done a fabulous job, and mainly because of the two interior defensive linemen, Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer. Those guys have been outstanding. The pass rush has been maddeningly inconsistent, even after the acquisition of Bradley Chubb, uh, for whom they paid a big price and. The guy right now is dealing with some injuries, but even before that, hasn't been the kind of impact player you really wanted. Um, I think the hope was that he could do for the Dolphins maybe something like what Von Miller did for the Bills. Maybe not to that extent because he's not quite as good as Von Miller, but but something like that, and it hasn't come close to being that. Jalen Phillips on the other side is a high-effort, high-effort guy who makes things happen but sometimes can have trouble winning his one-on-one -on -one matchup. So the, the pass rush has been very inconsistent. They've had injuries up the wazoo in the secondary, including to Xavier Howard, who made the Pro Bowl because Xavier Howard and some guys just saw his name and said, oh, let's vote for him. Um, and then and, the, and they've gotten a lot of mileage out of this rookie free agent, Cater Kohu from Division II Texas A&M Commerce, who, uh, I mean, has been really, really, really good. Uh, the only issue with him, he's a bit handsy at times. And in fact, in the game against the Bills, he had a key DPI on the game winning drive. Uh, but outside of that, his coverage has been really good. And truth be told, they didn't play a horrible game defensively against the Bills in December. Uh, the problem is they couldn't get off the field on third down. And, you know, and, and then that was a big issue. And they had their problems with, again, Josh Allen with his scrambling with that 44 yard run that kind of like, really may have been the biggest player of the game in terms of switching the momentum. What were your thoughts uh, now for those who haven't seen it, uh, Alan, uh, every time uh, this season that the bills and dolphins have played, he sends me a questionnaire uh, that uh, I give my response and it gives dolphins fans uh, a look at uh, what a bills writer thinks uh, heading into uh, those games at all dolphins.com. Please check it out. Uh, and one of the questions uh, that Alan asked me was, uh, how can the Dolphins defense attack the Bills? Is there a, I don't know if you use the word weakness, but if there's a way to take advantage, I don't remember the exact, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and, you know, it's tough because the Bills have a pretty comprehensive offense. They are pretty good on the offensive line. Um, they have star power at receiver when consistent. Uh, they have one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. They have a run game that can be productive on a relative basis. Obviously the dolphins take that away. My thought was because it's not going to be the run game against the dolphins, probably um, that it is to let Josh Allen throw the ball, which sounds strange, but as Alan was just saying, uh, running against this Dolphins defense from a quarterback standpoint is doable. And Josh Allen is one of the best in the NFL at it, probably top three uh, with Justin Fields and Jalen Hurts. So what can the Dolphins do? And I think it's to, I don't know, put a spy on Allen, make sure you do outside contain, 
uh, you know, emphasize that uh, and make him throw because two bad things have happened with the Bills this year. Josh Allen throws interceptions. He leads the NFL in turnovers. So even when running, he can fumble. Uh, And incomplete passes. Uh, The Bills are second only to the Jacksonville Jaguars this year in drops. Stephon Diggs has a lot of them. Gabriel Davis has a lot of them. Dawson Knox has a lot of them. Now, as a defense, you don't want to count on drops. That generally means that the ball's in the guy's hands. That means he's open and the quarterback's pretty good. I mean, some good things have to happen before you even get to a drop. But I don't know. What were your thoughts on that answer? No, it was. It's what I would have answered had I asked myself that question. But you're you're the you're the Bills expert, so you know I I, I bow to you. But that that's what makes sense. The last thing, like I, if I'm looking at it from a Dolphins perspective, I'm not worried about Singletary or is it is, is Hines getting the other one getting the carries offensively uh, out of the running back position. I'm not worried about either one of those guys. It what scares me is Josh Allen making things happen. You know, off schedule, and I like the Dolphins game on that side that Saturday night. I, they played great, uh, and the only reason they lost was because of Josh Allen. And it wasn't so much his throwing as what is the stuff he made happen on the on the run after the play broke down. Um, and I, the problem is that I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There's a ton that you can do against it. You can tell your your outside pass rushers, and this is where it can hurt the pass rush. But I would rather have Josh Allen getting two, three more seconds than having either Jalen Phillips or Bradley Chubb dive inside to try to get Allen, and Allen goes outside, and then he can get something on the run. So this is where I completely agree with you. If it's like keeping in the pocket, give him a little bit more time, I'll take my chances there as opposed to him making things happen, you know, off schedule. And the idea of a spy – and it's funny because I got like like Dolphin fans asking me, well, well, maybe this is a spot we use Channing Tindall, the rookie third round pick from Georgia, who's basically seen the field on defense. And I'm like, uh, no, they they tried him in that role a couple of snaps against Justin Field, and he basically went the wrong direction both times, and Justin Field <laughs> went right by. Uh, the kid's not ready for that kind of assignment. That's not going to happen. I don't know. If Dolphins have anybody on their roster as a linebacker who you can say like, okay, you're the spy. Um, Maybe Jerome, because he, because I mean, Josh Allen is such a physical freak. You need somebody who's big enough to tackle him and, you know, can keep up with him speed wise. And the closest is Jerome Baker, but Jerome Baker weighs 230 and Josh Allen is liable to truck him three or four times. Right. So, yeah. So it's not, yeah, there, there are no great options there. So, uh, you hope basically you do everything sound, keep him in the pocket and hope, you know, you hope Josh Allen is a little bit off his game. Uh, the other running back uh, we want to mention is uh, James Cook for the Bills. Oh, no. uh, he has only had six carries this year against the Dolphins, so you're you're forgiven. Uh, he hasn't done much. He did have a receiving uh, touchdown in that game in Week 15, but from a running standpoint, he's really kind of come on since right before Thanksgiving. Uh, he had a big game against the Browns, uh, eighty some yards on maybe eleven carries, I think it was. Uh, I'm looking at his game book from the Bears uh, three weeks ago, uh, 11 carries for 99 yards and a touchdown. But there are also games where he's barely used at all Four four carries for six yards against the Jets, for instance. So I, um, but he as the season's gone on, he's a rookie who was in the doghouse, not trusted by the coaching staff. But Sean McDermott trusts him again. So he he could be a factor if if a running back is going to be a factor against the Dolphins, maybe out of the backfield. But um, like you say, uh, the defensive tackles uh, have have just been sensational. A lot of tackles for losses uh, mm-hmm. for the Dolphins this year. Uh, for those from those two guys in particular. Yeah, no, there was a lot of complaining down here when Christian Wilkins didn't make the Pro Bowl. Um, unfortunately, that they're and no, they actually for Pro Bowl purposes they list him as a defensive end, even though the Dolphins usually line line up in a three four, and he's basically three four end. And for all pro purposes, he's an interior defensive lineman, and he came in fifth in the voting. So I, I'm, obviously he was recognized. Uh, but and it's ironic you mentioned James Cook. It's tough. It's lot- tough to knock Quinn and Williams out of the box. I mean the Jets defensive. T- I mean there's, yeah, it's yeah. it that, that's a tough position because there are there are a lot of great players and just not enough spots. All right. 
No, I was going to mention that the one running back who had a long run against the Dolphins, ironically enough, was James Cook's brother, Dalvin, when the Vikings played at Hard Rock Stadium in October. So maybe uh, maybe some uh, symbolism. I don't know. I'm trying to – we're reaching. Maybe. It's a reach, but I, just, I figured I'd, throw, I'd mention it. Cook. Let Cook cook. There you go. Um, Alan, any other thoughts on this game before I let you go? Uh, it's been very nice of you to give me uh, your afternoon here to uh, to talk Dolphins at Bills uh, Sunday at one. Um, yeah, I have, I have something else I want to that will interject that that please. I hope the Dolphins do. That I hope the Dolphins do is is their return game has been completely atrocious, and that's being polite the entire season. And in terms of their them returning or coverage, correct them returning, and they've also been bad okay. in terms of defending. Uh, oh, and I got a great piece of trivia for you after this also. <laughs> so uh, they, and they've been reluctant for some reason to use, they've used Cedric Wilson Jr., the offseason acquisition from the Dallas Cowboys, who basically who barely seen the field at wide receiver to return punts. And while he's been sure-handed, he's just not dynamic. And we asked both Mike McDaniel and the special teams coordinator, Danny Crossman, formerly of the Bills, um, had the idea of across their mind of using Tyreek Hill. And we got kind of a, yeah, we said Crossman for some reason refuses to discuss anything personnel related. McDaniel said it has been discussed. Well, lo and behold, in a six, six, six games against the Jets last Sunday with about four minutes left, they put Tyreek Hill back there. And perhaps it's just coincidence, but, and this was a punt from inside the Jets 35. And on those first two occasions, when, when Braden Mann punted inside the Jets, 35, his punts had gone for 61 and 57 yards. Perhaps pure coincidence because it's Tyreek Hill back there and doesn't want to give him anything to return. He had a punt that was down for 42 yards. And, I, and I'm thinking that's a hell of a coincidence. And you're going to need everything to go right. And every little morsel that can help it would is going to be needed to pull off this upset on Sunday. I think the Dolphins are crazy if they don't have Tyree Kill returning punts. Um, so that was my one thought there. The other one, great trivia for you. Kickoff return by Naheem Hines was the first one in three years and three months, as, as Josh Allen uh, referenced after the game. Did you know the previous kickoff return for a touchdown had been against the Dolphins? Of course. It was like oh, a high. Micah Hyde, when you return an onside on the onside kick. kick, that's right. I remembered okay. it being the onside kick, but I, yeah, that's that's true. That was against the Dolphins. And then taking it a step further, the last legit kickoff return, kickoff return for a touchdown by the Bills, also against the Dolphins. That was 2014. CJ Spiller. Alan, thanks so much for this. Of course. And um, whatever you need from me down the road, don't hesitate. But uh, very kind of you to uh, talk some Dolphins and uh, especially educate uh, Bills fans on what they might be seeing on Sunday because the team has changed quite a bit. Yeah, there would have been. And it's, it's weird, too, because when they played in week three in Miami, it was the Bills who were completely decimated by injuries. And now it's the Dolphins. And if you, you saw that game on Saturday night, both teams were in pretty good shape physically. And we got a really, really good game. So, yeah. Uh, Hoping we get another one on Sunday, even though I'm not necessarily sure it's going to happen, but we'll see. Alan, have a great weekend. You do likewise.